tell by the company she keeps by the people in this room tonight. Mm -hmm. So I say to each of you who are generally, or mostly my colleagues <laughs> and co-workers, that isn't an exciting time. We've had a big day all day, Akila. Uh, Akila came in early and discovered uh, the managers at uh, the AARL, the, uh, the research library, busily planning how to spend $25 million to make ourselves bigger and better. We had a long day. We started out. We started out at about nine o'clock and we finished about four thirty, sitting all day. But Akila, I said, I don't care what. I'm going to be here for you. You may see me slip out a little later. I've been <laughs> under the weather for a while. This is my first full week back after twelve weeks. So uh, I'm not running and jumping, but I sure am happy. So I thank you for being here. I think those of you uh, know that the Auburn Avenue Research Library is the only facility of its kind in the Southeast offering uh, the kinds of services that we, we offer, identifying, uh, acquiring, and making available research resources for people of any persuasion, as long as they're interested in discovering uh, materials, discovering and gaining information about our people and our culture. So we're very proud to be who we are. Uh, we have brochures downstairs in case some of you want to see a little bit more, learn a little bit more. Uh, but feel free to continue to come. We have excellent uh, programming on a regular basis. I just talked to Tracy, who tells me that she became a librarian because she came, started coming here and found out how, what a wonderful place a library can be. So we thank you for sharing that with me. Mr. Morris Gardner is in the back. He is our program um, manager. And I tell you, Morris keeps you busy. He keeps me busy anyway. So uh, we're, we're always having activities. Feel free to come and thank you for being with us. I think now, uh, as we sometimes say in the South, to some of you I'll be preaching to the choir by giving a, uh, an introduction to you of who Akila Nasakare is, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Akila Shakura Nasakare is currently the Director of Library Services and Assistant Professor at New York, I'm sorry, at New York. Yeah. I must be trying to, I must be trying to give, or give her her next position. <laughs> She is the Director of Library Services and Assistant Professor at New Mexico State University at the Carlsbad campus. A little about her education. She has a Master's in Education from Ball State University and Secondary Education, U.S. History and World Civilizations. Of course, she has a Master's in Library Science that she gained at Atlanta University in Academic Library Administration and Special Library Administration. I'd like to share with you some of her professional activities. She's a member of the New Mexico Consortium of Academic Libraries, member of the New Mexico State Library Association. She has served as program chair for the African American Studies Section Conference Program in 2012 at the American Library Association in Chicago. She is a past chair of AFAS from 2003 to 2005. She's also a member of the editorial board for Choice Current, Current Reviews for Academic Libraries uh, under the auspices of uh, the American Library Association. I'd like to share with you a few of her publications. She's contributed to research reference service and resources for the study of Africa. She is also the co-author with Ms. M. Elaine Hayes and Anne Page Mosby of African American Studies Core List of Resources. She's also a contributor to the Encyclopedia of African American History, 1896 to the present from the age of segregation to the 21st century. Co-chair with Sylvia Spinkle Hamlin, program committee of BCLA at the seventh National Conference on African American Librarians, 2010 Culture Keepers that was held in Birmingham, Alabama. African American Studies subject editor. She was an editor for RCL resources for college libraries under the auspices of the American Library Association from 2004 to 2010. And of course, in 2012, she's a co-editor of Black Librarian in America Challenges in the 21st Century. I 
would like to say it is my great honor to introduce a person that we all feel, I think, is not only our former colleague, but our good friend, Akila Shakur Nisakare. here, folks from my Georgia State days and from our uh, days when we were trying to save the library school, remember? <laughs> <that? laughs> and over here I look and I see new people, my mentor, Miss Lucilia Black Partridge, who I mentioned in the book, yeah. and a lot of my friends from Auburn, and it's just so wonderful to see you all. Woodruff, when we were Woodruff together for a while, yeah. <laughs> As you know, I've been all over Atlanta working <laughs> in the library. And I always said that Ben, I got here and saw Ben, I said, Ben, are you following me? Because <laughs> we started out together at Woodruff, and we worked at Georgia State, and then now Ben is a part of this wonderful staff here at Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, the book. Um, You've got some questions for me later. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to do it like a book interview later. But what I want to show you uh, are some of the contributors, all the wonderful librarians throughout the United States who helped us to pull this book together. Um, so let me get mine because I have mine marked off places. Okay. Who you? Uh, on uh, here we have uh, Dr. E.J. Josie, who we call the activist librarian. And I'm sure many of you have read his book, his books, the first one coming out in 1970, uh, The Black Librarian in America. And this book came about, this is a third, what we call the third installment on the theme, <laughs> uh, in honor of Dr. Josie. Dr. Josie would come to each of the library association meetings and he would just be received as almost like a king to us. We just really uh, respected him and the work that he that he's done to bring us into the fold of the American Library Association. For those, those of you who may not know the story, um, Dr. Josie was one of the, the pioneers of blacks uh, in the American Library Association. And you all chime in, you know, whenever you want, because this is a tribute to Dr. Josie and for all those ancestors who made the way for us to be here today. So basically, this book uh, uh, talks about Dr. Josie as our ancestor, paving the way and giving us instruction on what to do as we reach into the 21st century. Um, this book came about as a result of a session in Alabama back in 2010. Um, my co-authors, uh, um, Andrew P. Jackson and Julia C. Jefferson, um, had a session called The Black Librarian Activist, or The Librarian as Activist. And we said we have a tradition uh, in the, to uphold, and that is to teach our children to read. That is the main thing that we have to do, not only our children, but our elders, the whole community. So when I say teach our children to read, that is, that includes everyone. As you know, we're coming from a tradition where it was illegal for a black person to even be caught with a book. Many times you were beaten if you had a book. So as librarians, we should be activists in our communities and to push literature and reading, because that's what we need. When we think about the first, uh, the first generation of Africans, coming out of slavery. I call that our greatest generation, that first generation free. When they were so eager to learn that the literacy rate for African, uh, African Americans went from zero to almost 90%. They were searching for schools. They were searching to make themselves better. And they gained property. They started businesses. They had so much. And then the backlash of racism caused a lot of them to lose, you know, lose hope, lose their businesses that were lost, uh, and lynchings, and all of that at the turn of the 20th century. So we think about that generation, and how they pushed education, and education was pushed every generation since then. And then we come around to now, we have challenges of pushing education. 
So that is our role as an activist, and that is what Dr. Josie taught us, to never forget our role as librarians, to push literature, to teach our history to our children so they'll know where we came from and where they need to go. So in the 21st century, we asked, um, we want to find out what our direction is. So we put out a call for essays, um, for abstracts. We put out the call on the Black Librarians Listserv, BCALA, and we got, oh, oh <laughs> we got a lot. We got over 100 different essays. And Julius uh, Sekou, we also call Andrew and myself, um, we were in three parts of the country. I'm in New Mexico. <coughs> Andrew is in, um, in uh, New York. He's the head of the Queens Library. And then Julius is in Washington, D.C. He works for the Congressional Research Service. So we're using internet, you know, trying to pass files back and forth. And Andrew's saying, well, we still have uh, 2,003 words, so don't send me anything uh, greater than that, you know. <laughs> so you have to send, uh, uh, break your documents down from Word uh, 2010 to 203 to send to him. And so it was, it was very difficult, that's my point. You know, because we have different levels of technology. This technology changes, nobody can keep up with it. You know, the business, the, our, our, our municipal governments can't buy new software every time it comes out. So you know, it's, it's a struggle, you know? Y'all know what I'm talking about here at all, right? <laughs> so the technology was a challenge for us to kind of uh, read all of the essays and to have them all in one place. And then we saw, I said, well, this Dropbox, you know, I was always ready to try something <laughs> new. And Andrew said, what? What's that? <laughs> you know? But we were able to bring them all together and we selected uh, 40 wonderful, wonderful essays from librarians uh, in the public school system, librarians in uh, the federal, from the federal government, uh, archivists who were also librarians, um, public librarians, and uh, just all over, even medical. We had a special section on here called Special Libraries, and we got a series of uh, essays from medical librarians. Have you even thought? Who even thought about that, right? Now, these librarians specialize in providing information to our medical and health caregivers. And you know, they have to have the latest information. They have to have uh, things that are correct and true because they're treating us, you know, our health. And so we had some very, very wonderful uh, pieces from there. And I just want to read briefly from the school librarians and kind of go through. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, these are my co-editors. I've already talked about them. Andrew, no, no, no. I'm going to talk about them some more. I'm, gonna to see them. I'm not going to go real fast. Um, now, he never wanted to be a librarian. He started out wanting to go into business, right, to, to run business. But this is Seiku. Uh, uh, Bako, uh, Seku uh, Molifi Bako, we also call him uh, Andrew Jackson, because he's, he's part of triplets, you know, and so he keeps his Andrew Jackson name in honor of his grandfather. We said, what you, you got all this long name, but he keeps it, because he's honoring his ancestors in two ways. And he recently won the EPSCO Award uh, at our latest meeting in Anaheim, and that's for all of his contributions for African American history and culture. He is the director, of course, as you see there, of the Queens um, uh, Library, the Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center. Okay, you can go to the next one. Excuse me. I'm trying to get it together. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to open this up. Follow along. Okay, this is Julius. And Julius is a jazz drummer. And you know, he is just, just a multi-talented man. And he lives in Washington, D.C. And he provides information for the Congress to help them to uh, put together legislation and pass things that helps us. And let's pray that Congress gets some help. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> He's been there several years. And he is a, a very, uh, I want to say, conscious, very active, very high energy person. And so he was really pushing this book when we uh, met in um, Birmingham a couple of years ago. Um, well, Mr. Jefferson is an active member of many professions. He's written several articles about the black male uh, a librarian, and uh, he's, he's very active in ALA. In fact, he's an uh, um, ALA counselor this year. He was uh, elected to that seat. Okay. 
All right, as I pointed out, uh, this book is dedicated to uh, the legacy of E.J. Josie. It includes a uh, bibliography put together by uh, Sekou Andrew Jackson uh, on Josie, a tribute from the late, um, she was a school special, excuse me, as I look up her name, I want to bring uh, greetings to her. I know she's our ancestor, she's gone on. A tribute to Dr. E.J. Josie by Effie Lee Morris of ALA, she's a children's specialist. And uh, if I am right, she was responsible for a lot of the awards. Is that right, Ms. Mims? Yes. For the Claretta Scott yes. King yes. Award that is very, very near and dear to our hearts and very important uh, throughout the, the nation in terms of selecting those books that are culturally sensitive and for our, our children. And also, Sasha uh, Orange is a tribute to Dr. Josie, that, that area right there. Uh, Sasha Orange uh, was an uh, ALA outreach librarian. She worked with uh, the American Library <coughs> Association, the national office in Chicago. All right, let me go on to the acknowledgments. And you going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, uh, uh, one more. Okay, and the uh, acknowledgments and then the introductions which I did. <laughs> See, <I'm so> <laughs> I wrote the introduction. They wanted me to do that. And so uh, in writing the introduction, of course, I had to read all of the essays several times, like mm -hmm. they had. And then to, uh, to pull out the highlights and the main points of all of them and to bring it together and to entice you to read the entire book. And in the introduction, I mentioned those who made it possible for me to even become a librarian. As Ms. Hunter pointed out, my first master was in uh, education, secondary ed. I wanted to teach social studies and history, you know. But when I came out of school, there was riffing. You know what riff is, right? Reduction in force. So I, what am I going to do now, right? So I started uh, uh, working in a library as a PR person for the Muncie, Indiana Public Library. And then my husband, then, I've had two since then, so my first husband said, he said, he said um, I want to be a minister. I came back from uh, Africa, and I came back, and, and she said, well, let's move to Atlanta. I was going, Atlanta, I'm fine here, because he was a farmer, you know. I loved farming, and I was really happy canning tomatoes and doing all that in Indiana. But he said, oh, no, Reverend Williams, who was our minister at the time, graduated from ITC, and I want to go to ITC. And I said, oh, so, you know, so I had to leave my job as an information specialist for the public library. And they missed me too. They had this big article in the paper. You know, I really thought I was the stuff. They said, you lied to me with this big article in the paper when we came here. And I said, well, what am I going to do? I can't get into the Atlanta schools because at the time they were cutting and then the credentials from state to state, you know, it's just such a big problem. So I said, well, I'll just work. And Woodruff Library had the position open uh, working in government documents. So I said, OK, I'll apply for this job. And lo and behold, I got the job. And my supervisor was Lucilia Flip Partridge. And she sits right over there. <laughs> and so I love the job so much. I would open those boxes from the government and see all this wonderful information. And I try to, to tie them in with the students that come in. They were doing projects. And so you try to match the information with the students. And uh, Lucy said, oh, you do that real good. You really like that, don't you? I said, yeah. You go down there and see Dr. Dean, uh, Dr. Brown over at the library school. <laughs> and you know, the rest is history. So here I am, right, <laughs> 22 years later. You know, so I, I, in the introduction, I thank Lucilia for encouraging me to become a librarian. Because I always love to read, you know. And I always love African American studies. And, and this was a way for me to put them both together. So I, I enjoy you, and I thank you for your support over the years. She's still my dear fan. I'm wearing her birthday present, too. <laughs> <laughs> she made that thing. Yeah, she made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes, that's why the introduction. OK, now we can go to the next one. These are uh, the school librarians uh, that we selected. They are from, uh, they're from urban areas, um, from Buffalo, New York, Detroit, uh, rural areas, Barbara Montgomery's out of South Carolina. She wrote a very um, uh, hard hitting, a heart stopping essay about the, uh, the need for equal monies to buy supplies for the students. 
the white schools are still getting all the money, the black schools are getting less. So she talks about that uh, in detail. Followed by um, uh, Ayodele, um, she comes from, I guess that's, she's out of uh, New York, one of the urban libraries. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of all the urban, all the, the variety that we have. Of course, Karen Lemons, who's very uh, active in BCALA, she is with the Detroit Public Libraries. And if you've been following her on Facebook, she's been talking about how the, um, the state is trying to take over the schools as well as the public libraries. And if you know anything about the field, this is a, a major problem. Li public libraries are closing or being shut down nationwide. And why? Anybody know why? Money. There's not enough money to go around. And people really don't understand the value of a library, what we do. Because, you know, you think people are dumb now. <laughs> you wait till half the libraries come, and it won't be able to get things, right? We need our libraries, you know? And so she talks about how, uh, Karen talks about how in Detroit, uh, they're trying to take over the public libraries. In this particular article, she talks about school libraries, the need for uh, more funding within the schools, and how they have to to really fight to keep what little crumbs they have now, like books and materials uh, for their students, databases and computers. You know, it's not, it's not uh, cheap to buy all that. There's always some new software coming out, you know, that you have to get. And uh, that goes on with the others. Dr. Paulette Bracey is a professor at North Carolina State um, and uh, the library school there. So she talks about the challenges there as a former school librarian and teaching school librarian. She comes at it from that. So it's a very, very rich collection. Let's go to part two. Okay, Angela Blair Washington was a uh, librarian, school librarian. She was also a professor at the University of North Texas where she, they trained librarians or educated librarians. She died in March and she did not get to see uh, the book that came out. And so we dedicated our session in uh, Anaheim just recently to her. Standing, uh, this is her here on the left. This is her sister, um, Angela, uh, not Angela, but uh, Boxmeyer, Jennifer, Jennifer Boxmeyer. She also has an essay in the book on technology. She works for uh, uh, Princeton University. She's also an adjunct faculty member in the library school in that area. So uh, we dedicated and we remember Angela. She has a wonderful a piece in here about why I chose to stay in libraries. And I want just to read just a little bit of what she said. Where's my glasses? Oh, here they are. All right. Okay, so let's see. Page 24. Just a little bit. Just to kind of give you a piece of, of what's here. It's all about the students. That's why I have a career as a school librarian. When I am asked how can I work around today's self-absorbed youth with their disrespect for authority, bad attitudes, sagging pants, preoccupation with their cell phones, and a general lack of motivation for succeeding in school, I still say it's all about the students. My career as a school librarian is meaningful and my relationship with students is a symbiotic one. They need me, I need them. I can show them the way to go, so to speak. I can help them um, to grow up with a growth mindset. I can show them that I care about them. I can offer them 21st century liter uh, literacy skills uh, and become a part of their college career preparation and become a mentor and role model. In return, they offer me not only challenges that keep me from getting bored, but also insights, uh, insight into their lives, humor, energy, joy and the reason for being that I do my job each day. And so that's just the beginning of uh, the essay. There. She goes on to talk about how her life is enriched from the young people. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. Section two, public libraries. Public libraries. Um, these are uh, librarians, like I say, from all over the country. We have uh, from New York Public. Now, Andrew was in charge of this, and 
I said, you sure met a lot of people from New York on this list, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we were going by the quality of what we got, you know? We, weren't, we didn't care exactly where they were from. We did have some guidelines that we wanted to show a diverse you know, mix. But it's the, the richness and the content of what we got, and those are the, the items that we selected. Uh, there was one, she's a, a youth librarian. Her name was uh, Tamara Stewart. I think she's listed on there near the bottom. She talks about adultism, discrimination by another name. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read just a little bit of what she says about adultism in the public library. Glasses. <laughs> okay. As dedicated black librarians, we humbly stand on the shoulders of giants like Dr. E.J. Josie, Dr. Eliza Atkins Gleason, and Clara Staten Jones. Many of us chose this profession because of our passionate belief in freedom, equality, and service. Nowhere is this belief more evident than in the public libraries. Public libraries embody uh, the democratic ideals we hold dear, freedom to read and learn, equal access to resources, quality service to all. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts, public libraries and public library service don't always live up to its lofty goals. Throughout the public library, though the public library strive to provide great service to all, it is true that we could do a better job in providing service to some than others. Discrimination, both intentionally and unintentionally, continues to be a problem in 21st century libraries. And you would think she's talking about race, but she's talking about the way we treat those young people who come into the library with the saggy pants and with the earphones and the cell phones and, you know, she said, they are treated in such a way that they feel like they're not wanted in the library and or that they're less than the other patrons. And she goes on to say how we're making mistakes because we should listen to young people, really listen, ask questions, ask what they think about, validate their thinking, welcome their ideas, lay back and curve our inclination to take over, let them talk. Be willing to learn from them. Be willing to let them make mistakes and you help them to correct them. We should provide training for them and take them to, uh, to greater levels of decision making and leadership. And, and the last thing she says, give young people accurate information about the way the world works and never lie to them. And so she gives us wonderful uh, inspiration and uh, insight into um, youth librarians here. So, um, that's just one. You see all those others. There's lots of wonderful essays there. Okay, let's get to the next one. Academic libraries. Okay, we have Dr. Ruth Jackson from University of California, um, Riverside. Deidre Spencer, she's a science, um, art librarian at the University of Michigan. And she talks about what it's like to be an art librarian. How many of you knew that there were such a thing as an art librarian? Okay, mostly the librarians though. <laughs> <laughs> But she talks about how she is perceived uh, in Ann, um, Ann Arbor when folks come into the building. You know, I'm saying, Are you a librarian? Are you a librarian? And she's sitting at the desk and saying, Yeah, may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they ask questions like, uh, Where did you, uh, where were you trained? You know, and uh, uh, how did uh, you get to this field? So they're just kind of questioning her because they can't believe that. Uh, that woman is running this library, you know, at a major uh, institution, you know, University of Michigan, you know, one of the Big Ten schools. So she talks about that experience and how she lovingly and uh, goes through the process of educating them. You know, she don't let it bother her because that's what Josie talks about. You know, we deal with this day in and day out. Mm -hmm. You know, so we just keep moving and keep striving and keep achieving in spite of it all. And she does a wonderful job in her her essay talking. Experience. And of course, we have uh, Felix uh, Unalizi from the HBCU. He talks about managing libraries in HBCU. Uh, Dr. Bird, um, did, she was an IT specialist at one uh, institution, and how they said, a woman, IT, head, head of IT, uh, right? So she deals with a lot of those stereotypes that, you know, we, we can't manage technology. She talks about that. She's now uh, head of library in. Um, Oh, in San, 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 San Diego as a Catholic institution. And Lisa talks about educating 
uh, providing an, an, what is um, library instruction on uh, using the technology and, and using traditional books and resources. All right, next. Next. <laughs> okay, from the Federal State Libraries, Michelle Fenton is from uh, the Indiana Public Library, and she has a website that talks about uh, black librarians in history. So if you get a chance to Google her, uh, she has a wonderful website. She, she goes all the way back uh, to the 1894 when uh, Charles Jackson was the first, Charles Williams was the first uh, uh, librarian, and she comes all the way up to the day. And all of those who, not just because they're librarians, but those who have contributed, you know, to the field, <laughs> and who have something to, to talk about and uh, celebrate. Stephen uh, Booth, now he's a unique uh, librarian. He's from Morehouse, and he started out as an archivist and decided he wanted to go into uh, the field of, of librarianship. I wanted to read just a little bit of what he said, if I can get to it here. Stephen Booth, uh, the title of his essay is A Charge to Keep I Have, and I kept wanting to switch that around, you know, <laughs> being the editor when they say charge I, I have to keep, but um, I was outvoted. I said, leave it alone, Akila. you can't change everybody's words. I said, okay, well. <laughs> and so he talked about choosing a career in librarianship. He says, I chose to pursue a career in librarianship during my senior year at Morehouse College while majoring in music. Having no aspiration to become a starving artist and teach, I investigated a number of graduate programs within the arts and humanities. I began to explore disciplines with emphasis in research, specifically uh, library science, and after a recommendation from my music instructor and mentor, David Morrow, I went into librarianship. Even with this experience I had from working at the public library in high school, being a library assistant, and for a performing arts camp and serving as a librarian for the Glee Club, I had never considered being a librarian. Does that sound familiar to <laughs> <laughs> this all of us? Um, this could be attributed to the fact that I never saw a black male librarian or never heard of a Morehouse man choosing librarians. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes on and talks about his career. He is a, a major librarian, reference librarian, and archivist at the National Archives in Washington. So he did pretty good for himself. <laughs> so, okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, from the library school. We were hoping to get a lot more from the faculty, the black, uh, the African-American mm -hmm. faculty at library schools, but we didn't get that much. So the two that we got, we worked, we put them in here. Mm -hmm. Angela uh, Washington Durr and then um, um, Maurice Wheeler. And they speak to retention and the battles that African-American faculty members face uh, in trying to get tenure or doing promotions and how uh, it's just been very, very hard for them. And he mentions uh, race and how, um, how that has really affected the growth of, um, of black library faculty at our schools. And remember back in 2003, we were fighting to try to keep our school here. He said, there's always a question of productivity. So that's a, cha a challenge to us, to produce in our field as uh, African-American librarians, as, as professionals. Let's produce, you know. And not to say that they didn't produce over there, evidently they didn't do enough. And there was a lot of other factors involved in that closing of the library school. And it was just a very traumatic time. And I'm still upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we have another school which opened in South Georgia, and they, the, you can get an MLS online now, so you don't have to like travel. So a lot of these degrees are online now, and library and uh, uh, master's degree in library science is, is one of those. So they talk about the various issues there. Uh, Angela Washington Durr is a grad, uh, doctoral student at the University of North. Texas and Dr. Wheeler is a professor there as well. Okay. Library technology, we mentioned uh, uh, library technology and how uh, technology is just driving our field. I mean, you don't, you have to try to keep up with it. You know, we have a lot of reference books, like I was talking about my position in, um, in New Mexico when I got there. I fell in love with the library because it looked like it was stuck in 1940. 
And, uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, well, this is uh, something that, you know, I could, could really help to, to, to change. And so uh, they had just um, taken their collection of 17,000 volumes and created an online um, catalog. They shared the catalog in Carlsbad with Las Cruces, New Mexico, and Las Cruces. Las Cruces being the mothership school, and then you have the two community colleges, and uh, well, actually there's three community colleges. So we all work together, and we have this one catalog. And the card catalog was still there. Wow. So our first thing we did was to throw the card catalog out. Wow. You can go to YouTube, and you can see us, woo! Wow. <laughs> the cards all up in the air. And uh, that was like the first step for these people 20 years after everybody else, you know. <laughs> 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 oh, I they like on the third and fourth, you know, uh, version of their catalogs. Wow. So it was a, a good time, it was, it was a good experience for me. So these librarians talk about how technology has changed their libraries. Uh, Fantasia Horn is a public librarian. She talks about ways we can keep up with the technology, certain things to read, uh, certain uh, feeds to get on our, our mobile units so we can kind of keep up with what's going on. Gladys Smiley Bell, who is a former president of BCAOA, uh, she's also a uh, ALA counselor now, and a member of the Black Caucus ALA uh, Board of uh, Governing Board, I guess Executive Board. She and Dr. Harvey Stokes, who is a music uh, uh, professor at their school in Virginia. What is it? Hampton. Hampton, yes. They talk about how they use technology to digitize music collections at the HBCU archives there and how you can get access to uh, the scores and sound uh, of uh, their rich collection there. Jennifer Boxmark and uh, Aline Farmer Hayes talk about how we went from the Mark Records. Remember the Mark oh, Records? Yeah. How we went from that to whatever the catalogers are using now. <laughs> <laughs> the content DM and you know, and all of this uh, uh, metadata things that they're using there and how it enables us to share information globally. You know, we can get online and we could search uh, the British National Library, you know, we could search if you know French, you can search the National French Library, Bibliotheque. Hey, uh, we can, you know, do all of these things uh, because of the technology. And it all started with the Mark Records. So they trace that history and provide uh, a readable, um, two readable essays for us and for those who are not in the field to get an understanding about what that's all about. And Ira Rebel, she is a, a, a well-known name here in at, uh, Atlanta. Ira and I are friends. When she came down. Uh, one year to visit, uh, she wanted to go. I took her over to the library school to meet um, the dean at that time. It was Dr. Gunn. And they talked about um, getting monies to have a, t a digital program for the library school. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. that was not to be because the library school closed. But Ira mm -hmm. did not give up. The monies that she got from Cornell University and from the Mellon Foundation was used to establish the um, HBCU Library Alliance, which enabled HBCU libraries throughout uh, the United States to become digitally viable, I guess, you know, to take all those rich collections and, and make digital collections so that the world could share uh, in, in the richness. And also to train the staff, train the staff, train the staff to use this technology. And so the funding is still there, thanks to the, the hard work of Ira Rebels. She's gone on now. She's now a library director at um, Hampton, Hartford, Connecticut, and the public library there, Hartford Public oh. Library. Mm -hmm. All right, so the wonderful, a rich a variety of, of essays. And this is a hodgepodge, issues and profiles. This is also uh, Andrew's section, okay? He just couldn't take anything out because everything was so rich and, and just flavorful. We said, well, we, we gotta leave it in. Tracy Hall, uh, a consultant in the library field, recently hired by Queens Public Library, talks about the black body at the reference desk. <laughs> so she deals, she comes at it from that academic uh, 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 preparation. She talks, she, well, everybody uses references and, and goes into the literature and, and uh, cite their sources, but this is a really academic paper. 
So it's a rich variety. You have the academic papers, and you have just the, the casual uh, essays, and you have uh, biographies. This is kind of like a mixture of things. Uh, Herb and Mary Bibbo talk about the legacy of Dr. Josie when he went to IFLA. And IFLA is the International Federation of Libraries Associations. That's an international body. And he talks about how uh, Dr. Josie said, we will not support any library uh, um, coming out of, or what was it? You have to respect that. He talks about um, Dr. Josie and his, uh, it was a, a uh, presentation about uh, the apartheid in South Africa at the time and how the, United, uh, the American Library Association need to say something about what was going on in South Africa. So he issued a proclamation and they talk about how that all came about at IFLA. You know, so that's a wonderful essay to read. And of course all the others is just Carol Nurse, a dear friend of mine, we were in library uh, training together. She writes about what it was like to work for a vendor. Like, you know, you talk about EBSCO and Gale and all the other vendors. And as a black person working for a vendor, because so vendors, what they do is they go around to libraries and try to sell the libraries on, on yeah. new products, right? And you know, she said, she show up and they look at her, who, who what, yeah, you? That, that's that race thing again, you know? They didn't know she was a professional. She could represent Wilson, you know, uh, publications. But she talks about what that was like. And so she always spent time with the staff because the support staff is usually African American <laughs> women. <laughs> and they told her, you spend too much time with the staff, right? And so she talked about it in a very, very uh, comical way. She is very funny. When I go to conferences, we always get together and we just laugh, laugh. <laughs> We're now on the board uh, of BCALN. <laughs> anyway, it's just a variety of wonderful things. One last thing, Benny Tate Wilkins. Um, is a uh, author. She wrote a book about the black librarian in the West. So uh, her essay is, is very, very good. It talks about our our our, uh, our profession from that perspective. Okay. What's Julius provides a wonderful uh, epilogue. Uh, he talks about winter in America, and basically what that boils down to is that even though uh, we've been in the field. Uh, uh, accepted into uh, American Library Association since 1970, we still run across that, that racism. And, and those things are, are always in our face, but we do not allow that to stop us. We continue on to contribute to the profession and continue our activist uh, legacy, and that is to teach our children to read. Mm. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Continue now with the conversation with uh, Akil. I told you it's going to be the librarian's version of the After It's Express. <laughs> um, I don't have an accent to go with it. So um, I'm definitely going to remain off screen. But uh, Akil, you talked about your, you know, um, your co-editors. I'd love for you to talk just a little bit more about how the idea evolved and then your collaborators. Okay, um, as I pointed out, we were uh, at the seventh national conference of African American librarians, and we were in Birmingham, Alabama. It was August 7th through the 10th, and it was hot. And we had a session uh, entitled The Librarian as Activist, and Julius and um, Andrew were the um, facilitators of that session. And we had a lot of young people there, a lot of recruits in the library field, and they were talking about their experience you know, in, in, um, in library school and how tough it was for them. And they had never heard of uh, Dr. Josie and all of our other um, great librarians. So this was an opportunity to kind of introduce ourselves and to offer ourselves as mentors to them and to let them know that there is a legacy of black librarians within the American Library. So it came out of that. So um, next, I'd, I'd like for you to, my question to you is that um, 
you talked about it in your presentation, and I think many of us here realize that there's an important history of documenting and chronicling the vision and history of black librarianship, of course, through books of scholars such as E.J. Josie in his groundbreaking books, uh, The Black Librarian in America and The Black Librarian Revisited. Could you speak to the importance of his work and that of others and how they've impacted you over the years? Okay. Well, there's another one called the, What Black Librarians Are Saying. And I uh, enjoy, um, uh, I guess, uh, social history, you know, current contemporary history, because we need to capture that. We think that our lives are just so mundane and so empty that we don't need to uh, record them and keep them. But um, it, it's very important that we um, capture that story. So when we uh, got together in uh, Birmingham, we talked about Dr. Josie's books, you know, and those by Annette Finison and others in the field and how that has affected us as librarians because we read them so we felt grounded and it gave us confidence. So I think um, in reading that, it gave me confidence and uh, provided a road map for me to know that I needed to write the story so that those coming after me would have a bridge to go on the rest of the way. Um, come on, I know there's more you want to say about that. Oh, no. Well, we, already we're talking about another, another book, right? <laughs> but um, there's just so much to be done and we're going to, um, Kansas City in September at the National, what's called the Joint Conference of Librarians of Color. We were meeting with the Native American librarians, the Chicano librarians, and the Asian American librarians. And we have a session on documenting your, his your library history. And at that session, we will deal with how uh, those various groups begin to document their history. Because you know the, the whole thing of uh, a written record is foreign to a lot of these cultures. And so we just need to let them know the importance of it and how it helps our, our young people to, to know that they do have a history. It may not be written you know, print, but it'll also be available in other forms as well. As we develop in the 21st century, of course we're using various formats to transmit information. All right, well you, you've segued into one of my next questions <laughs> actually. Um, has American, and in your opinion, has the American Library Association made significant strides in being more inclusive to other minority librarians, such as Native American, Latino, Chicano, Asian, Pacific Islanders, in your opinion? And why is it even important for those groups to also be involved in policy making in regard to the American Library Association? Okay, well, I think it's important because the world is naturally diverse, you know, sister. The world is naturally diverse, you know. You, there's no such thing as all white this or all black that, you know. We are naturally uh, a, a melting pot, so let's not uh, pretend, uh, let's not do this thing forever, you know. Let's not have American Library this and you have all the little different groups in it. It would be nice if we all could be, you know, one group, as the brother said, can we all just get along? Mm -hmm. Lache, he's gone on now. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's just important for us to recognize that we all have different cultures and different gifts that we can bring to the table. And the American Library Association, over the years, it had to be pushed and prodded to do the things that needed to be done for the various groups. And at this last conference, as money gets tight, you know, uh, people are dropping out, not paying their dues, <coughs> they want to shut down a lot of the different sections, like you have the uh, Native American section, you know, it's really small, never had more than uh, 150 members, or you have like AFAS, which is African American Librarian section, we have 200, and it's now, uh, you know, they're coming up with this rule that in order to maintain your section, you have to have at least 400 members. Well, we've never had 400. You know, we only really had maybe about 15 active members. People sign, <laughs> people sign up, you know how that is. People sign up, you know, they don't do the work. So we see this as an attack on our little groups because they're trying to save money here and there and the other. But they're not providing us with any alternative, uh, like providing, uh, if you ever go to American Library Association, there may be one or two black authors, you know, or there's some black authors who go, 
why did they get that person? What is, why, do, why are we honoring that particular book? And there's a lot of other books that we know are much, much better. Other authors that could be there. They're not uh, reaching out to bring in those substantive uh, authors that we know about. There's a lot of fiction, in other words. Fiction is good, but I, we need to read more than fiction. And when it comes to um, the read posters, this is one of my pet peeves. How many of you? <laughs> we, need, we need more read posters. So I don't know how we go about um, getting uh, ALA to to provide some better choices for us. I mean, I'm, I love the tennis player, but that blonde hair and all of that is, is fine, but we need other images for our kids, for our children. You know, I love me some Dan Zale Washington, <laughs> you know? But you know, that's kind of old. There's other people out there who need to be represented and, and shown uh, to our youth. These read posters are just awful. So you all write in, <laughs> you youth librarians, y'all write in and say you want to see different kinds of people on those read posters. So I, I think they could do more. I mean, I'm not knocking what they've done, but they can do more. Can you talk a little more about how, from the standpoint of these various minority sections that we're talking about, how eventually, whether they function well or not, eventually it's going to affect a kid that lives in South Central LA who is Chicano or a kid who lives in South Georgia who's African American, whether or not these people are represented well in the LA. Okay. Well that gets uh, leads into the ethnic studies realm. It is uh, ethnic studies librarianship is very important in that um, they help to to screen or select the best literature for our our, our youth. Um, and providing the best space. For example, uh, we have um, wonderful uh, children's literature for African Americans, and we have uh, a way of screening them and selecting the best and, and awarding them, like the Claretta Scott King Award uh, is one, for example. And this is also the case with the Asian American um, section. They find, they award their best literature writers, and they make that known through the, college, the resources for college libraries, which I, I did for a number of years. And uh, so the, they're like the, um, the, the specialists in those areas, because they provide us with titles that we can pass on to our children as far as reviews. Uh, many of you probably read American libraries, right? And they have wonderful reviews on children's books, youth books, and uh, academic books, as well as public library books. And many of these are provided by uh, ethnic libraries who are subject specialists in their particular areas. So I know you don't like the word gatekeepers, but uh, well, whatever word you want to replace, but it's you. What I hear you saying though is they have a, a great opportunity and responsibility to to help right. more collections. Because librarians are very, very powerful people. You know whether we realize it or not, especially the collection developer, because you're buying materials for the community, and what you buy can shape your community. You know, we know that for a long time they tried to put every black book in 300s, remember? We're all social problems. <laughs> but now, you know, the, um, the catalogers and everyone's kind of more enlightened. And we see that the books are, are put into their proper subjects, not because it deals with a black person or was written by a black person. You know, Elaine, they tried to put everything in E185. <laughs> but that's not possible anymore. So we see that growth, you know, in the field. So can you now talk a little bit about what you see as the greatest challenges and issues for the Black Library in the 21st century as we move forward? I think the greatest challenge is getting people to see that what we do, the importance of libraries and librarians. Because as uh, funding, you know, gets tighter, you know, they're looking to, to save money they want to be able to keep the jail open, so they may cut the library budget, the public library budget. They want to uh, keep the football team, so they may you know, cut my book budget, that kind of thing. So we need to uh, educate our coworkers, the administrators in the colleges, the administrators of public libraries, to let them know that libraries are important. Across this country, from California to New York, they're, they're closing libraries. And the first places they close them are in African American communities. Because we don't utilize them, we don't realize how important they are until they're gone. So that's one of the challenges of the 21st century, and that's pointed out in that book, 
you know, it's racism, all that, yeah, yeah, but everybody suffers when the library is gone. So we have to push to keep our libraries open. That's the major challenge. And now I'd like to open the floor for just a few minutes for questions and answers before we get into the actual book signing. So if any of you have any questions, questions you'd like to ask Akila or shout out, shouts out to her, uh, then uh, now would be the time to do that. Uh, Akila, did you have to shop for a publisher or what, did you do that in house? Oh, this is a story. <laughs> no, Andrew, who has written several books. Andrew uh, has written several books, uh, and he uh, he went to his publisher, who was a scarecrow publisher, has published major library uh, materials, many bibliographies <coughs> over the years, uh, musical scores. It is an academic publisher. And our book is uh, our textbook, and that, you know, so we didn't have to shop around at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Were there any perspectives you were looking for, expecting? You got an array, you set up of essays, but was there something that you were hoping to get that you didn't get? Yes. Um, yes. That was a very, that's a very good question. I was question. Oh, the, uh, the question was, was there, um, we have a wide variety of, of uh, subjects within the book. Was there something that I wanted to get and I did not get? And yes, uh, I didn't get anything from a cataloger or a metadata librarian about um, t uh, subject headings for African American places or African places, place names and all of that. Because that's very important, you know, because if you don't have the right term, search term, you're not going to find find it. So I didn't get anything in that area. And what about library directors? Yes, I did get some things. Public library directors responded, and they talked about administration and those kinds of things. And then uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Jackson from University of California, uh, Riverside, excellent piece on uh, all of the challenges that she see for academic librarians. Yeah, that's one of the better better ones that I like. It's one of my favorites, I should say. Uh, yes. Uh, on the cover of your book, you have the interior of the Library of Congress. Yes. <laughs> and I was curious why you chose that space, and what does that mean to you as a uh, librarian that we great reading? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we didn't select the, the cover. <laughs> <laughs> that's the publisher did that. And that's a, a um, I guess, promotional tool that they use. Because if you look at Dr. Josie's books, they were just plain. They didn't have a, they just plain black cover with gold letters. There was no, no, no art I'm on it. Because I'm really hurt that you, and that you said that. Yes. And that leads into my second question. The Carnegie Color, li color Library mm -hmm. have an important history in the development of black libraries. Right. And Auburn Avenue came out of the early Carnegie Library that was up the street in Hilly. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the collection that Mrs. Uh, McFeeder started is the one that eventually the came here. Yes. Came here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm not familiar with Josie's book, but that legacy, that history of the early colored libraries that you know, in cities like Atlanta and Houston, I think Louisville, mm -hmm. um, what, what does that mean in terms of, you know, as a librarian, I know the School of Library Science at Atlanta University, they started, what, 42? 42, they came from Hampton. Came, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but before then, a lot of the librarians weren't trained. I mean, they, they sort of learned on the job to these That's public right. libraries. That's right. That's right. Uh, they learned uh, on the job uh, through um, working as, as clerks. But um, in 1940, when um, the library school came to Atlanta University, that was probably one of the first programs. And uh, the dean, uh, the African-American dean, came from the University of Michigan. Uh, that was Elijah, um, what's her name? Um, Gleason, Gleason, yes. Yeah, so there were schools around, but a lot of us did pick up on, on the job. Yeah, and then later to go get uh, certified. Dr. Uh, Josie's earlier two volumes talk about that tradition. And uh, Annie McFeeters, who was uh, also a part of that legacy uh, of Auburn, uh, talks about that in her books, as well as um, she has an essay in Dr. Josie's second book, uh, The Black Librarian in America. But you're also referring to the architecture, right? 
Well, yes. Well, the architect. There is an the architecture, but it, but one of the things that came out was the fact that it promoted jobs for librarians mm -hmm. mm -hmm. who here before didn't have jobs, and so uh, I just thought it was significant. Well, there is a book out now. I haven't had a chance to read it, or I haven't seen it. It's by George Grant. It's about uh, librarians' name for African Americans, but I, I really don't know the title. But George Grant is the author. Perhaps he deals with the architect, you know, uh, architecture of, of the Black Libraries, the Carnegie Libraries. But I know he's gone across the country and um, uh, created the book. Uh, listing all the ones that are named for African Americans. Yes. You also mentioned Michelle Fenton. Was that the woman who said? Yes, she's at the State Library in New York. She has a wonderful website.